Hey everyone, this is Josh Jones. Thank you for tuning in to today's webinar, Recruiting Recruiters, Righteous Propositions and Unwavering Prioritization. Uh, looks like we've lost somebody. Jennifer, come back. <laughs> um, thank you to Zoe and to our friends at Jim for making this webinar possible. Thank you to Jennifer, Keisha and Nikki for joining on to this panel for this very, very timely discussion. Uh, there is how do I say it? There's a, there's a talent shortage happening right now and it's affecting the recruiting industry as well. Uh, there's not enough recruiters out there. So I know a lot of teams are feeling the pinch and by tuning into this webinar, we should be able to get you pointed in the right direction so that you can make an impact. Um, we're joined by Zoe Wren from Jim. Hello, Zoe. Hi everyone, I'm Zoe. Um, I'm so excited to be here today and to hear our great speakers, Jennifer, Keisha, and Nikki, um, share their learnings and best practices on how to recruit the best recruiting talent in today's very competitive hiring market. Um, JAM is proud to be sponsoring this webinar as we strive to help sourcers and recruiters to connect, nurture, and hire the best candidates to meet your business goals. We have a quick intro video to Jem to show you, and then we can dive into the panel discussion. If the video piques your interest and you would like to learn more about Jem, please reach out to us at sales at gem.com. I'll click on the offer tab and request a demo of Jem there. Thank you. Enjoy the video. Many organizations find it difficult to attract qualified talent that will drive the next wave of innovation at their company. And we're seeing this challenge across the industry from large enterprise customers like Cisco and McDonald's to agile tech companies with amazing brands like Slack, Peloton, and DoorDash. That's why GEM was created with the fundamental belief that the traditional ways of recruiting, like managing candidates from inbound sources like career pages, posting on job sites, et cetera, are no longer sufficient to attract the levels of top talent required to compete in today's digital economy, especially as it becomes harder and harder to find the right talent for key roles. So think data scientists, software engineers, or really any hard to fill role because more and more companies are competing for candidates across the same limited talent pools. The challenge of maintaining a healthy pipeline is compounded by the need to attract for diverse talent. For organizations that value diversity, this makes the pipeline problem even harder because our inbound applicants don't always represent the most diverse talent pools and we have no control over who applies. These challenges have driven companies to look at better ways to engage with talent where it is in the market. And that's why companies from Cisco to Twilio are taking a more proactive approach to engage, engaging with passive talent rather than waiting for the right people to apply. That's why GEM was started. GEM's founders were engineering managers at high growth companies. As hiring managers, they quickly realized that the traditional tech stack for recruiting wasn't built to support the passive nurture of talent. Because ATSs were designed to track inbound applicants, this leaves most recruiting organizations stuck with managing relationships and passive talent outreach in manual, time-consuming and error-prone processes like spreadsheets, one-off in-mails, and emails. This means a poor candidate experience, and so many missed opportunities in engaging with top talent when the timing is right. GEM was created to fill that void that exists in the market, a purpose-built platform to manage passive talent engagement and give recruiting teams that workflow, the automation and analytics they need to be more efficient and consistently build great and diverse schemes. And one of the great things about GEM is because all of these passive talent relationships are now tracked in one central place, you'll get much more visibility and predictability into your own hiring funnels, allowing your team to make more data-driven approach to recruiting and hiring. Once again, thank you to Jim for making today's webinar possible. Uh, today's webinar is being recorded and by the end of the day tomorrow, you will receive a link to the recording of today's content. Uh, I've placed the HR, CI and SHRM credit codes uh, in the chat if you're, if you're looking for those. And if you are looking to hire recruiters or if you're a recruiter looking for your next role, 
I encourage you to check out recruitingjobs.com. Now let's get started with some of this uh, discussion. I'd like to start with some brief introductions. So Jennifer, could you start? Hi, yes, Jennifer Hash. I'm based in Oakland these days uh, and I've been in recruiting for about 20 plus years. You, I may need to move around the house. I have a, some work done, a dog around here, so just heads up. Um, I'm currently with Rippling, a very exciting startup that is uh, solving employee data. Uh, before that, I was with Uber, uh, as well as um, Intuit for about 10 plus years where I really grew up in corporate recruiting. And super excited to be here today and chat with y'all. Thank you. Um, next up, uh, Keisha, can you tell me about your background and what brings you here today? Yeah, absolutely. Um, my name is Keisha Jones. Um, it is a pleasure to be here. Um, I am currently the Director of Talent Acquisition for Southwire Company. It's a um, manufacturing company that specializes in uh, manufacturing wiring cable. Um, <clears throat> I've been in the recruiting industry for a little over 20 plus years, a long time, grew up in this space, all I've ever done. Um, certainly an ambassador, very passionate about recruiting and um, I am excited to be here today. Great. And I saved the best for last. Nikki, tell me about your background. Hi, everyone. I'm Nikki Russell. I am the um, head of global talent acquisition at Rocket Power. Um, I've been in recruiting for about 17 years now. And my favorite thing that I'm doing right now, of course, is recruiting for recruiters. So I head up the internal recruiting team at Rocket Power. Great. All right. Well, let's get started. Um, the market is crazy. Uh, everybody, it seems like, is looking for recruiters. We're seeing recruiting compensation um, hit astronomical levels uh, right now. Um, I'm wondering, I won't even go there. It's just, we'll just say it's interesting. Um, but I would say that there's some difference between, uh, you know, recruiting recruiters and recruiting general talent. I think recruiting recruiters hits a little bit different. Um, what are some things that you should keep in mind and, and be focused on as you begin to re recruit recruiters? Uh, Nikki, I'll start with you. Yeah, great question. So I think recruiting recruiters is actually one of the most challenging roles to recruit for. Um, you know, you have to think about the fact that you're having a discussion with someone who is used to being the person that's leading the conversation, right? So it's always them leading. So as you're having a conversation, they're used to being the brand ambassador for their company. And, you know, you're having to deep dive into their specific skills and abilities. Oftentimes I find it that the folks that we're interviewing or I'm having conversations with have a hard time deep diving into their skills and their experience. So it's really like, having that level of conversation with them, making it a conversation, not really an interview of asking 100 questions, but hey, this is just a conversation. Let's talk a little bit about your background and your experience and really helping them understand that, you know, they're on the opposite end. They're not leading the conversation. So, you know, I think the best way for me personally is, you know, understanding that how you engage with recruiting candidates it really helps them be able to become better recruiters themselves. They're looking at you, you're mimicking, you know, your years of experience. So they're always looking to you to be the best recruiting experience that they're looking for. So. I think that's a great answer. Um, I want to get points from, from the other panelists, but I have kind of a follow up question. Do you have any tips for making some of these recruiters, um, feel a little bit more comfortable. I know when we're kind of performing or we're on stage, we tend to talk faster or talk louder. Like how do you get them to kind of pump the brakes and just relax? Yeah, great question. So I think it's pretty much going back to that conversation. It's letting them know, here's gonna be the process, the topic of our conversation, like we normally do with any other role, but sometimes they have to hear it themselves. They have to understand that you know, this is a time for you to showcase and highlight what you're able to do. Uh, we want to make sure that this is a great fit for you as much as it is for us. And just leveling them down a little bit to be able to understand that, you know, we want the best for them. And it truly is a conversation 
oftentimes for recruiters, I would recommend that they go and have a conversation with one of their recruiter friends and say, hey, I'm getting ready to interview at XYZ. Do you care to ask me a few questions and see how it goes, right? Um, as recruiters, sometimes we're not the best interview interviewees, right? Mm -hmm. So <laughs> I would recommend that they go out and have a conversation with somebody and see if they can't get a little practice. Yeah, that's true. So so for me, I make it a point to try to, when I'm interviewing recruiters, to, to disarm them um, because they're coming to this conversation, again, used to being on the other side of the table um, and um, just trying to remove that barrier and get them to relax a little bit has always been kind of, um, it's been helpful. Um, Still a tryout. Still, I'm still interviewing you, but I, I try to make sure that they're um, comfortable and relaxed and, and disarmed. It's a good point. It's the question. If the question is like, um, you know, making them more comfortable, I th I'd say setting the tone for the interview. Mm -hmm. um, right now, in recruiting for recruiting, um, we change the process in this market because it is so aggressive. And I'm the first interview. Uh, for all recruiters and sourcers. And the reason is, is because it's, I, I come into the call, I say, hey, my name is Jen. This is, you know, this is an exploratory conversation. Um, and moving me up in the process as the head of recruiting um, shows, the, shows the market we are very interested in bringing in top talent, um, shows that we're dedicated to bringing in top talent. But also, I want to show you our ugly. I do not want to pretend that it's easy to work at Rippling. I do not want to pretend that we're not scaling faster than some days I'm like, whoa, I was at Uber. So I, I'm saying, whoa, at Rippling. And I want people to know our ugly. I want people to know, I'll give you a perfect example today. Um, this person came in the process months ago and she was, uh, based on her timeline, she couldn't, you know, interview at, at a pace that, you know, would have helped. Anyway, um, I am not clear on exactly what will be on her plate, what the clarity I did not have. And I shared that with her and you should have seen her relax her understand. And I would rather show you my ugly, our ugly rippling's ugly than promise you. And so those are two things. I set the tone of the interview. I'm very vulnerable quick so I can have their vulnerability as well. And we can figure out if this is even something that we want to go forward with. And it's okay if you don't, based on what you're saying, because some people really know what they want to do and they only want to do one thing and that's totally okay. Rippling just isn't the, wouldn't be the place then. I love it. I, I, I like the fact that you talked about showing your ugly. I mean, I think if there's a, if there's a gap between what is presented and what is reality, that, that hits in any situation, but I think especially within town acquisition, uh, professionals in this space are extra sensitive uh, to that. And so that needs to be managed. Um, next question. Um, I mentioned at the beginning of this webinar, um, compensation's a little bit bananas right now and in and, and a lot of different industries, but I'm seeing recruiters, it's like, oh, wow, you can spell Boolean, we'll give you a buck 25 a year. <laughs> it's like, wow, okay, that was, that was easy. Um, what are your thoughts on, on the compensation situation? And then if a recruiter asks to know the compensation before they'll even speak to you, um, how does that affect the process? And does that change your judgment of the recruiter? Yeah, I'll take that one. Um, I don't think so. Um, you know, I, compensation expectations um, depend on so many different factors. Um, I don't want to waste people's time and I, I don't waste my time either. So I'm actually okay with them asking. The the problem I have have is the delivery. Um if there is, you know, it's all in how you ask the question. Um I don't want to say, you know, introduce myself and the first question that comes out of your mouth is, you know, well, how much are you paying? Um, I, I just think it's all in in how you ask the question and um you know, if you're being professional and, and those things matter more than the question itself to me. I agree. Um, I, I think we're going towards an entire world of pay transparency. Mm -hmm. And so I think we have to be very comfortable with this question and very comfortable asking it. Um, 
And so the question doesn't, it, it doesn't throw me off. If it's the first thing they ask, I try to have remove the bias of like, why is it the first question and go, why, why could they have, could they have just bought a new house? Could they be in some sort of tight situation that this is super important? Um, so we don't screen out at all on that question. Um, but, and we don't, we don't bring it to the assessment. Um, but I, I, I think what's hard is it's wildly, it's a range because we have tiering in geos um, and we have tiering for tech versus non-tech. Um, and, and then it depends on the assessment. So we could have a senior recruiter open and I tell you a range, which is pretty big. And if you don't assess at senior, well, then you're not going to get, you know, the range is going to fall in where it should. So, um, again, it's like that transparency all the way along this, you know, in aligning on expectations. But I just think as a, as a, we need to be comfortable with pay transparency as partners. So close partners to HR, we need to help train others um, it's just going to get more and more ingrained in what we do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree with both of those comments. I think the biggest thing for me when it comes to compensation discussion is, you know, especially as Jennifer was mentioning, the first conversation is an exploratory conversation. We need to learn more about you other than what's just on your resume or on your LinkedIn profile. I want to know you. I want to know your experience. I want to know all the in-betweens on your resume and your LinkedIn profile. What are some of those things that you can really do great? Um, that's going to affect that skill assessment too and the ability to which you can bring forth your best self to work every day. So really being able to take that full assessment to be able to say, here is the compensation. I would just give you a range right off the bat if you ask me the question. So let's be fair and understand a little bit more about you and the role and how you would be a good fit. And then we can have that salary compensation discussion. Mm -hmm. That's great. Um, Jen, you kind of touched on this already. Um, and I want to come back to it. It's, it's prioritizing the recruitment process. Um, so you mentioned that there's situations where you kind of change the order uh, from what might be typical. Um, Keisha, Nikki, do you have any examples of situations where you've maybe reprioritized or kind of made some changes to, to make sure that, that the candidates are, they recognize their importance, they stay engaged, they're, I don't know if fast tracked is the right word, but it's kind of managed effectively? Hmm. I don't, I don't know if I've made any adjustments in our process. Um, as far as the, the kind of the candidate experience is concerned when I'm recruiting recruiters. Um, but we move faster these days. Um, you know, it, it's, a, it's certainly a faster process. So I'm trying to turn around interviews quicker, um, you know, assessments quicker and things like that. But um, the qualifiers are still remain pretty much the same. Absolutely. I will agree with that. I think um, our process is still the same, but with the market being as hot as what it is right now for recruiters, we definitely have to pick up our pace and move a lot quicker than what we normally would. Mm -hmm. For individual contributor roles, we changed the, the order of the interview. We also um, debrief and offer decision hire. If there's a decision hire, yes, we extend the offer within 24 hours because we find that it's inevitable recruiters today and sourcers and anybody in this or in recruiting, ha we're going to, they're going to have multiple offers and we're finding um, that if we are faster on the offer in a sincere way, we really do want them. And that's the only reason they're getting the offer. It, it has helped us close faster. Uh, and, and because we are, we're really consistent with the timing of our process um, in the manager and leadership roles. I've dropped the take home. And I've asked them just to demo a dashboard they're using today. You know, they can black out anything, you know, confidential. I find that that's helping us too, because even in not recruiting roles, anytime you're asking people for any kind of take home, it's pretty tough in this market. So I've eliminated that for recruiting as well. That's brilliant. I like that. Um, we've got kind of a follow up question. What about, is there a shelf life or expiration date on these offers? Because sometimes you'll make an offer and then the, the candidate's like, well, let me, I'll, I'll let you know in March, <laughs> maybe not that far out, but 
they try to buy some time. I haven't run into that. No, Mm -mm. that's good. I have. And I just, I'm just, I don't, I, if I want you, I want you. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to say your offer is going to expire. I mean, you know, two months might be hard. Be like, okay, what's going on? How can we, but yeah. um, If I, I just think that that's, um, if there's a, critical business reason and it's like we cannot absolutely have you start two months later then i would just tell you that but it wouldn't be because i just have a policy i was exaggerating a little bit but i definitely (laughs) (laughs) some candidates are shopping around almost i feel like there's some organizations that are almost like it's like those brick and mortar stores they're like bring us any ad we'll beat any price well i feel like there's companies that are like bring us any offer and we'll beat it by 10 percent or whatever it might be Um, so I do get the sense that sometimes candidates are just trying to buy time because they're talking to two or three companies. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so one of the things that I let them know in our ugly is what we can't do. We can't do sign-ons, you know, so they know up front that they're not going to have a sign-on. Um, but we are competitive in our pay. So the sign-on, so you're absolutely right. Um, it, it, but again, I, I don't want, if I'm interested in a candidate, what we'll do is we'll probably bring in a stakeholder and say, hey, COO, CFO, C2, whoever it is, can you jump on the call with this recruiter and help us push the timeline? And um, hopefully we've revealed all this through the process that they're really wanting to wait for XYZ offer. Uh, and then, it, you know, the table turns sometimes like, listen, we have two other people that we can extend offers to. We can't wait for you. So it's just really setting expectations. Yeah, I think for us to, we always believe that, of course, we're always closing in every conversation with a candidate. So we're hoping by the time we're at the very end and we're making that offer, we're both on the same page that, you know, we're going to extend the offer and hopefully they're going to accept or we know of any barriers or anything like that. I think with the market being as hot as what it is, you know, at that very stage when you're extending the offer, whether or not you know, they want to push out their start date because of those other offers, right? And hopefully for us, we've provided that candidate experience. We've let them know that we want them to be a part of our team and they're just as happy about us as we are about them. And I think it all comes down to that line of communication and the transparency that we had the whole time too. I like the fact that you mentioned that you're always closing and that was going to be one of my questions. So I'll just head down that path now. Um, What are some closing tactics? Are there specific questions? How do you, um, early, early in my career, not even recruiting, I think this was more of like a sales training. We used to talk about circling the wagons. You know, you you basically, you isolate the objections and you circle the wagons around them. Do you have any insight for for the folks that are tuning, tuning in today? For us, as far as always closing, I think it's just when you're having every conversation, every single conversation that you have should be understanding what's important to that person and that individual. It's like with every role, right? We have to understand what's important to them, that they fully understand the role that we have. Is there a skill set, an alignment match? Are they interested? Uh, What barriers are there to them for us moving forward? What other things that they have in play? I think a lot of it comes down to also making sure that, once again, going back to that clear communication and transparency of this is what they can expect as they go through the process and making sure that you're sticking to that, right? Like one of the things that we talk about constantly on my team is Kindness, that's our theme for this year. Kindness changes everything. How to be kind to yourself, be kind to others. But it's doing what you say that you're going to do. So if you're saying, I'm going to follow up and I'm going to do this, here's what they can expect. And you're follow following through with that during the whole process. That's also with closing too, because you're doing what you said that you are going to do. So every conversation that you have, you know, you're closing and saying, hey, are we on the same page? Are you still feeling the same? How comfortable are you? Um, You're also leaving that conversation with the door always open. Hey, if you leave this conversation today, if you happen to think about anything, don't be afraid to circle back, ask questions. And I I personally just always leave myself open, right, Um, to answer any and all questions. 
So to me, that's what it always is. And by the time I'm at that final conversation, I kind of understand what's important to them, mm -hmm. right? What is their main decision maker for making the move? And I want them to do what's in the best interest for them. This may not be the right role for them, and that's okay. But I've built that relationship with them. And no matter what happens moving forward, I want to support them in whatever role that they do moving forward. And it's all about that relationship building and closing. Yeah. Um, I, I think, Nikki, you hit the nail on the head. Um, <clears throat> for me, it's about listening and understanding like what their motivations are, their needs and wants and um, what what's motivating them to even search right now. And then building um, a, a realistic preview or a realistic presentation around kind of what those um, what their their needs are and what they're looking for. And sometimes it'll be a match and sometimes it won't. Um, but I think, um, you know, for for us, um, you know, our superpower is our culture. Um, and um, such a, in, even on the recruiting team, it's kind of the spirit of the recruiting team and, and how well we work together. Those are our selling points. And my hope is throughout that interview process, they can see that. Um, and, you know, throughout that candidate journey from the time they engage the site, um, and apply for the job, they can kind of see um, that culture embedded in it. Um, so those are all factors that help with the closing. But the most important thing is to, to listen. Um, we know what we want, but, you know, today we have to also understand what we got to meet people where they are in some some instances. And it's just understanding what their needs and wants are. 100%. Anything else? <laughs> Okay. Um, this is, I'm going to pivot a little bit. Um, this, this industry, I feel like everybody seems to know everybody and maybe that's a slight exaggeration, but I meet people all the time and we, we have the same friends and the same contacts and so on and so forth. Um, however, there are situations where maybe you don't know somebody from Adam. Um, so if you receive a resume or you've got a LinkedIn profile in front of you, maybe somebody said, look at this person. Um, you don't have any references. So how do you narrow down on this candidate's capabilities? Jen, you mentioned earlier, I really liked it, how you how you talked about watching somebody navigate their ATS or, or navigate some yeah. of the systems that they're using. Um, what are some other questions that you would suggest digging into? Yeah, I think, um, you know, I've hired a lot of people I don't know, right? And don't even know through the web network. And what are... Um, what I've always relied on are two things is the what and the how. It's the competencies. So the competencies have to keep your true north compass on the skills to do the job. And then the level you can figure out. Um, and then the how is a values alignment. So I, the first thing I did at Rippling when I looked at our values, I put um, behavioral-based questions on the values. Um, because a lot of times people ask you about your culture. Well, your values should really be represent your culture. And by asking those types of questions, you can also assess, is this, a, is this the, will this be the right motivational fit? Um, so if you stay consistent in your interview process and your pre-interview and your reference checking, it should, it should help eliminate any kind of stress around not knowing somebody. Uh, I'm not a back channel referencer. I, I, cause I think some people have bad managers, have bad mm -hmm. experiences um, and so I, I, I don't think that's fair to people. Um, I've hired people with, um, really, um, backgrounds that are not consistent, um, you know, based on, in, in, based on the assessment. So I'm, I'm pretty open, uh, to the experience. The competencies will keep me, keep us as a true North team. And I go last in the debrief. Uh, I'm very leaned into my team. So if my team is a no, very rarely have I said yes, um, even though like I might have some biases towards that candidate. Um, and um, in fact, somebody we worked with in the past that everybody was a yes on the team was a no and we actually had to pass. So that's amazing. I like that. Um, and I like the fact that you go last because I think when you're in a meeting and leadership goes first, you see a lot of kind of taking that person's lead, um, which can be it's like a different type of bias, really. So yeah, that's unfortunate and and not leading to a good process. Um, I'm and I just want to let everybody in the audience know I am tagging your questions, and we're going to do our best to get to the, 
these. Um, but we're kind of moving through some set questions at this time, but we will have some time at the end. Um, but continue. Um, does anybody else have anything to add? Not to that question. Okay. Uh, some candidates are going to get away. Um, and that's the nature of the industry, no matter what you're recruiting for. Uh, but all is not lost. And I think the way that you you manage these folks that uh, either they, they didn't accept your offer or maybe they're a silver medalist for your team. Um, can you share ways you're able to get recruiters uh, to refer other recruiters into your organization, even if they're not getting the offer or they declined your offer or whatever? How do you um, how do you encourage them to, to refer other folks in? Yeah, I think going back to what I was saying earlier, too, I think a lot of it has to do with the candidate experience that you're providing to that recruiter, um, how you treat others throughout your interview process. It speaks volumes, right? So for them to walk away, even though they're not a good fit or they're not interested to walk away and go, oh, but wait, I had a great candidate experience at Rocket Power. They have some really great stuff going on over there. Because recruiters know recruiters, right? Um, so for them to be able to share that positive experience with other people or whether it be on social media or whatever that may look like, to be able to go out and have those conversations and be able to speak on our behalf, that speaks volumes. I think mm -hmm. also for me, I'm not afraid to say, hey, you know, I know this isn't a good fit. You know, feel free to share with other folks if you happen to know somebody and they're not sure if they're interested in rocket power, just give them my contact information. I'll jump on a quick call. It doesn't have to be an interview. It can be that exploratory call and just opening myself up to answer any and all questions. Um, I think that's what's key and that's what's important to asking for those referrals. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. We did a um, referral jam um, and, um, it basically what I'm seeing is because think of our world, how busy we are, where it, it takes us, you know, I have squirrel moments all the time, like to stay focused on this website, you know, everything. And so I had a meeting and an opportunity, um, to have the team together. And I just took 20 minutes and we just created a tracker. Everybody put it, put just keep going, put names down, put names down. I don't care if they're not looking or if they are looking, um, where they're sitting, what company they're at. Sometimes you just have to be a recruiter yourself to get those uh, recruiters, uh, to get those referrals. Um, and if you're not getting referrals and you're a leader, <laughs> you might want to look at your culture scores or leadership scores because the team should want to refer other people in. And, and if they don't, just being really vulnerable and honest with yourself and understanding, you know, hey, they could say something like, hey, Jen, it's been stressful for six months here. I'm not going to refer people because of that, you know, and, and just really making it safe for them to share that feedback. I mean, that's a whole nother conversation, but um, I think sometimes you just have to be a recruiter if that makes sense. Like, and they're all the hiring managers also, almost, and you're just pulling, pulling people from them because we're, we're just all too busy to stop and recruit for everybody in the organization. You know, it's so, but you mentioned distractions. And then right then I heard the Slack notifications. <laughs> it's like, we're constantly battling the, the getting pulled in some other direction. Um, I love the, the, the referral jam. I think that that's amazing. Uh, I think, and, and people are coming into the comments saying that that's a, that's a great idea. Um, and that kind of leads me to one of my questions about building those recruiting for recruiters muscles, right? The R for R. Um, I think that kind of answers that question. I think that's a great way of, of flexing those muscles. Um, I think recruitment should really be it's a family thing. I mean, and when I say family, the entire organization needs to be involved with recruitment and sourcing and all of that for it to be effective, especially in today's environment. Um, everybody's just so hungry for, for talent. Um, what are your thoughts on, on references? I, I see a lot of teams go back and forth on this. Um, I myself would argue that a lot of times a reference represents a moment in time and you cannot 
de define somebody's entire career on this vignette into their performance or whatever it may be. So just because they like kicked ass in 2019, that doesn't mean they're gonna do that in 2022. Or the opposite can be true. If they were terrible in 2021, it doesn't mean that they're gonna be terrible in 2023. Um, so what are your thoughts on references? Keisha, I'll start with you. Yeah, okay. Just uh, look, I'm gonna be transparent. <laughs> I don't always, I don't ever ask for references. Now, thinking back, I'm thinking, should I have taken some time to ask for references? Some cases, yes. Um, but I, um, you know, I, I don't, I hadn't, for, for my recruiters, I hadn't necessarily asked for references, just thinking back on my time at Southwire. Um, and, um, yeah, some cases I probably should have. So, yeah. I appreciate that honesty, though. I yeah. mean, it's not, it's not always easy to be vulnerable. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I think um, for me, what's important is how that person works with me inside of Rocket Power, because how they worked previously, as Jennifer said earlier, like, you know, they could have had a bad manager. There could be so many variables to that. And I'm 100% confident in my team, right? So bringing somebody in is going to be a whole different experience here than what they've had somewhere else. So I'm confident in my interview vetting process to where I should be able to bring in the best of the best. Now, I know, of course, we all know that things happen and sometimes it's not a great fit and people leave. But um, with that being said, I feel like I'm comfortable and I don't have to go out and do a reference check. Um, too many variables there. Along with pay transparency, I think we're going to see a shift in, in when we can and cannot do references because it can cause stress in candidates that are they going to call my you know, they can get conflated with a back channeling. It can, so we do them, but um, at an individual contributor level, they're, they're very fast and very, you know, um, light. And we make sure not connect with anybody that could jeopardize their role or, or give them that stress. References become more important the more senior the role. Because if you hire a manager that is not good, you messed up the whole team for a long time. And you're cleaning up that stuff Quite, for quite a while. So that's really important. It's Josh, it's so hard to do a good reference. Like it's so hard to get deep into that why and go deeper um, because I haven't found the the perfect way to put them at ease and be like, listen, I, you know, I want you to sh share their ugly a little bit. So I, so I know what I'm going to be coaching, you know? Um, so I try to prep the candidate to make sure and know, like, I'm not looking for a no from these people. I'm just looking to understand who you are. That makes sense. Um, I, it's hard. It's a challenging thing, and I see both sides. And I think we are, we are entering a, a place with with the transparency around compensation and how references are going to be managed and all these different aspects. And I've heard of, of companies that will not do references, meaning that if you contact that organization, it is their stance that nobody on the team is going to provide a reference about anyone else, um, which is also kind of an interesting take. Um, Jennifer, you touched on this. You, you've talked about sharing the bad or the ugly a couple times. Um, because how, there's so much. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> well, I mean, I would argue that there's going to be candidates when you when you reveal the bad, when you're like, "Hey, you know, this is this is what's going on. Let me let me lift the veil and show you what's really going on." There's some candidates that are going to pull back and be like, "Oh my god." but there's some candidates that are gonna lean in and where they see smoke, there's an opportunity. Um, and a lot of times those candidates that lean in are who you need to hire. And yep. so the reveal, you and I talked about this, Jennifer, you and I, when we first met, we talked about, I think you said, I, it was something about the reveal. And then on the, on the summary for this webinar, we called it relishing the reveal or something. Relishing like the reveal. Mm -hmm. So, um, I'm sorry, were you? Go ahead. No, no. Yeah. So there's a time and a place, 
you mentioned like you want people leaned into that. And so you, you do have to be careful not to hire everybody that wants the pace rippling your company or whatever you're doing is at right now, because it will change. Um, and so when you're sh when you are doing the reveal and relishing in it, you also want people that I'd say for the majority of, of all of us on this um, webinar is the organization is going to change. The team is going to change. So it's almost like you're assessing for change, change capability. Right. So lifting the veil might be um, the, you know, the two things that are really challenging on the team and the two things that are really challenging in the org right now. And just having very, very nicely just stating like, um, you know, uh, one of the challenges is that we don't have a um, we might be switching to a in-house ATS in six months and that's going to hit our productivity um, etc. So just letting them know what's coming and seeing their reaction. Um, for most people, they won't tell me it's not a fit. I have to actually, so let me share a little bit more on this, you know, open the veil a little bit more. It isn't always easy for an individual contributor to be able to assess themselves and be that self-aware because they want the job they're interviewing. So you, you do have to do a little bit of work on the assessment and yourself as a leader and go, you know, based on all these answers, I can tell this is not a fit. And I've had it do it a few times. And when that happens, I do do the um, I do meet with them for 15 minutes and say why we're not moving forward. Um, and sometimes I get agreement and sometimes I don't. And that's OK. It becomes more obvious in leadership and they self-select out faster in leadership. Did that answer your question? It does. And I really hope <laughs> I just I love what you said. And I really hope that everyone on this call is giving feedback, especially if candidates have taken time to actually, it's one thing if somebody's applied and you've never spoken with them, but some of these candidates that have taken time out of their lives to meet two or three times, um, they deserve a phone call. <laughs> the love of God, call them and let them know. And there's ways to give feedback without getting yourself in trouble. Come on, we're all smart here. We can, we can give them something uh, so that they've got something to act on. So I love the fact that you said that you take 15 minutes and talk to them. Um, and I think you're exactly right that depending on the level that somebody's at, um, they might not have the ability to do that self-reflection. Um, let me ask you this. Um, there Again, there's not enough talent out there. There's not enough, or maybe, our, maybe talent demands have changed. Maybe that's what it is, who knows. Um, but the, the demands for recruiters are very, very high. Um, do you require that recruiters have worked in a certain discipline? If you're looking for tech recruiters, do they have to have tech in their background? If you're looking for somebody to, to do recruiting for sales and marketing, do they have to have that sales and marketing piece? Uh, or is having some recruitment under their belt enough? Will you bring them in and train them? So for me, it, it depends. Um, I'm very, I'm very open, actually. Um, for some roles, um, for technical engineering roles, I would prefer to have someone with experience because of the type of, um, you know, the type of recruit. But um, for other um, recruiting seats, um, I'm open um, to training. Um, I actually, when I look at my team dynamics, um, what I've noticed over the years is that the um, folks who have very little to no recruiting experience are typically the ones that are doing very well, um, at least at, at, at our company. So I'm very open um, to um, the will set more so than the skill set. And um, I um, actually in, enjoy taking the time to train recruiters. Love that. I'm, I'm actually putting that in the chat. Will set versus skill set. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I spelled it right, but... I like that. Anyone else? Anything to add? I would say uh, next year we'll be able to. I love the idea of bringing in and what you're doing. Um, I'm uh, when we started building the team um, this year. I my vision was I need to bring in more experience to start. And then I want to that next layer. I want to bring in sourcers that want to become a recruiter. So leave room for internal promotion. And then that next layer will be coordination to sourcer, et cetera. And then I have on a big, you know, um, we're doing our 20 year 22 planning right now. The vision is to have a recruiter training program because we have SDR sales and we have support all these um, great 
people in towns and people in the organization that might be interested in recruiting and would love to bring them through and train them. But I, we also have to be realistic about what, what, you know, what the business needs and what we can deliver yeah. and balance when we can actually do that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that's what I was going to say for us to, you know, we have to look at the needs of the business. So for us, it's a little unique because the needs of the business come from our clients. So if our clients are looking for a specific uh, skill set, of course, we want to honor that and give them the best top talent that they're looking for to meet their demands and their needs. So it's important for us to make sure that we're bringing in the right talent for them specifically. Mm -hmm. That, that makes total sense. Um, before we went live on this, we were kind of talking about grooming or creating or building recruiters. Um, I'm aware of a, at least a couple of teams, one in particular that, that has been identifying folks within fulfillment and putting them through sourcing and recruiting training. And, and some of these recruiters grow up, leave the organization, and they're working for big companies, Fortune 100 companies in a town acquisition capacity when they were first identified in a warehouse somewhere. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think I think more and more industries and more and more companies are going to need to start taking a close look at initiatives like that. Um, mm-hmm. Is anyone here doing anything like that? We are. So, I, go ahead, Keith. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, you know, one of the things that you often hear whenever you're interviewing recruiters, I always love to ask folks, even if I'm not interviewing, if I meet somebody out, I'm like, how did you get into recruiting? We all know people say that they fell into it, right? Mm -hmm. So here at Rocket Power, we actually have created a build a recruiter program where we're taking folks that have zero experience, bringing them in, training them and giving them that training something that I wish I would have had when I first stepped into it, right? Um, But to be able to give them that growth and that mobility, um, you know, on top of that too, you also have to think about, you know, your growth for each of your individuals within the organization too. So we've also thought about that in the sense that creating training programs for folks maybe as uh, Jennifer was saying, you know, you bring them in as a recruiting coordinator and they want to move into a sourcer. How do you do that? You have to provide training, right? But I want them to have the correct training. I don't want them just to go into it and not be successful. That's not Mm -hmm. fair to set them up for failure, right? I want to create great success. So to be able to have those, you know, training courses to be able to show that we are investing in our folks, going back to what Keisha was saying earlier in the culture, that's important, right? So building out um, the Build a Recruiter program is huge for us right now. Um, and I'm really excited of what's going to happen for 2022 as we build it out. So I'm excited for you. Keep in touch. Yeah. I want to hear about how that goes. Uh, Keisha, you were going to say something. Well, yeah, no, I, I think that's um, awesome that they're well on their way um, to building out a structured program. Um, ours, you know, are, is really in the infancy <clears throat> and a less um, less formal. Um, but what we are doing, what I am excited about is, um, you know, we work in the manufacturing space and we have a lot of um, warehouse specialists and machine operators who actually have undergrad degrees and um, very motivated and um, interested in growing within the company. And, um, I, you know, for us selfishly, I am thinking it would help um, the recruiting team build a lot of credibility with the business if we can pull people who actually worked on the manufacturing floor um, to recruit um, those types of folks. So we're, we're going to bring in a small team um, to um, try this out and, and see, you know, hopefully it, it motivates people and see that you can progress within the organization and um, spend a lot of time just building them up and, and getting them where they need to be from a recruiting perspective. They know the business already. They know how operations work. Um, so we just have to b- build the recruiting skill set. So super excited about that. Uh, you as well. Keep in touch. Oh, yeah. That is awesome. I love yeah. it. Um, we've got some questions coming in from the chat. And some of these came in earlier, but uh, I want to go ahead and try to get to as many of these as we can. Uh, do you have any advice for an experienced recruiter getting back into the job market after several years of being at home with family? What are the best ways to get back up to speed? 
Yeah, I recently had this happen. I had um, a person reach out to me to say, hey, Nikki, I took some time off, wanted to spend time with my family, want to get back into it. And that individual had been a recruiter previously. My suggestion was, why don't we, you know, bring you in as a sourcer, let you, you know, have a couple months just to see, um, to get your feet reestablished and get it wet again, and then kind of move from there. Um, I think it's important to network. Um, had that person not been introduced to me by a colleague or a friend, it may not have turned out that way. So my recommendation would be reach out to folks um, that you know. Um, reach out to me. I'm happy to have that conversation to help you. Um, it's all about reaching out to network and ask for help on how to reestablish back in the industry. I think a couple things can help. One, go on interviews and the questions you stumble on or the things you don't know track. So track what you are looking for. So when you say get back into the workforce, you need to know before you get back into the workforce, what is important to you? A scale up, a startup, an established company, what hours are you willing to work? All of that matters to the company you're going to. So if you told me flexibility is the most work-life balance and flexibility and, and, you know, being able to shut off at five, I would say, you know, we don't have meetings after five, but work-life balance is not the place for rippling right now. Um, it will be two years from now. If you want work-life balance, hot, like really structured and training, and that's going to help you be a better parent and live your best life, there is no shame in that. You should go to organizations like LinkedIn or Facebook or Google that are doing all this amazing training they will and the, and get get the experience you want with Gem, which is my team's favorite tool. <laughs> um, sequencing all the new things that are popping up, and then if you find that you're like you have a bit more flex in the future and you want to get a little bit a little bit grittier, you know, go into that startup or scale up. But know what you want for your personal life before you you know um, going into the interviews. Don't be afraid to go on interviews and not get the inter and not get the job but understand what the market is asking and then figure out what companies train on that and supply that to you. That's going to, you will, there's no, I have no doubt you will get a job because of the market, but you have the power. So do a little bit of your own homework to, to, to get you the, the right match. Speaking of Jim in the offer section right now, there's a link to request a demo from Jim. I highly recommend it. Their team is amazing. What they're bringing to this market is absolutely incredible. Uh, so if you've had the chance to speak with anybody that's working with Jim, you'll you'll hear their praises sang over and over. Uh, definitely check them out. Um, can you tell us more about assessments you use on recruiters, if any? So the only, so we're using an assessment um, it's an employee per personality profile um, and it adjusts based on the type of job that we're recruiting on. And we use those for um, the HR, people and culture, and also recruiting. We use them throughout the company, but um, I do use those just to um, the company that we partner with. They, as a result of you doing that assessment, it provides us with interview questions that we need to hone in on in addition to our competency-based questions. Um, and that's very helpful. Um, so that's really the only assessment that we're doing um, with our recruiters that we search for. Yeah. What about metrics? Um, what recruiting metrics do you think are most important? This is probably a loaded question, but... <laughs> Let's go down that path. I think it depends on the maturity of the organization. I don't have a very mature organization. Uh, majority of my team is under a year right now. Um, I don't think it would be fair to have this laundry list of KPIs and metrics when we're still, we're, we're at adolescent as a company. Mm -hmm. um, as we get, um, so what is, what is, what is any scale up? fast moving, huge startup need, they need hires. So of course, offer acceptance rate and hires. And then what's under that is your conversion rates. Um, and then the values are always there. So the what and the how. As we get better as, an, as a team and organization, I want to do hiring manager scores. I want to 
candidate sat, all of that. But if I take, you know, if I have candidates do a bunch of surveys and I do nothing with that data, is that even fair to that candidate? Um, so um, eventually, as they get more sophisticated, they get more EQ versus skill based. But where Rippling is today versus where Uber was, very, where Intuit was, we are much more um, in our infancy in metrics versus I can see us two years down the road. Um, I want to make sure I get this question right. Do you look for recruiters who have experience with OFCCP or is that just a perk for that knowledge? Um, even if your business is not a federal contractor at the time. I No, I would say I don't necessarily look for that skill set. Um, we, we have a great legal team. <laughs> um, so it's not necessarily a huge driver. I think it's a great question. And what I would suss out with that is, are you telling me you are very compliant? Are you telling me you're structured and um, you follow process? We need that. So one of the metrics I missed was compliance. Um, data is so important. And so um, offer compliance, process compliance, pipeline compliance. So I would say, no, I'm not looking exactly for OFCCP, but if you're telling me you have that and you know, that is important for you and how you are um, as a recruiter or a sourcer or whatever your role. That to me is something you can leverage in these interviews because everybody needs more compliance. It used to be, this is kind of my opinion, it used to be recruiting could get away with less documentation. And I remember I even said this in meetings, oh, well, recruiters are not, you know, don't hire recruiters to document, hire them to close. We're not there anymore. Mm. We are too data driven. Um, the data is too sophisticated. We have to have dashboards. We have to. And so the recruiters that don't document will not keep up with the recruiters that do. Mm -hmm. Totally agree. <laughs> I think that's a good place to, we're, we're almost to the end of the hour. Um, and I want to thank everyone on this call for being here. Jennifer, Keisha, Nikki, um, I know you had to take time out of your busy schedule and it is a crazy time in recruitment right now. So I know every minute counts. So thank you so much for being here and having multiple meetings about this session. Uh, we really, really appreciate it. Huge thanks to Zoe and our friends over at Jim for making this content possible. Um, and huge thanks to everyone that tuned in in the audience because without you, we, we wouldn't be putting this together. So, so thank you for that as well. This was recorded, so by the end of the day tomorrow, you will receive an email with a link to the recording. So stay tuned for that. Uh, everybody on this call is super friendly and super easy to find. So please feel free to reach out and make a friend. And uh, until next time, we'll see you soon.